Hello, happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to the LLKCEM's live stream for June 20, 2020. Hope all of you had a fantastic week and enjoyed the awesome weather that we had. Uh, it's awesome weather, but the terminology that we use for this type of weather is called June gloom. And people say it's gloomy type of weather, but for us runners, we love June gloom because in the mornings, that nice marine layer uh, takes over uh, and blocks out the sun and we get to run and not have to worry about, you know, working up a sweat and getting all tired and fatigued or sunburned. Uh, we love June gloom weather. So hope all of you took advantage of the June gloom weather because in a few weeks, the June gloom weather is going to be gone and we're going to be getting to what's called the, the dog days of summer where it's just hot, hot, hot. So uh, June gloom. It's also Father's Day weekend. So Yay! Happy Father's Day to all of you, uh, th those fathers, uh, and I uh, want to say, give a shout out for all the, the all the awesome things that you guys do in terms of uh, what you do for, for your family, for your community, for your work. Uh, definitely appreciate all the things that the, the fathers uh, do uh, in their lives. I have to admit though, as a father, I, I can say this, but fa the Father's Day, we all know that it is not the most important uh, parent uh, celebration day it's actually mother's day we know that statistically it's been proven as well uh i think traditionally uh people spend twice as much money on mother's day's gifts as father's day's gifts i think uh anyone could attest the fact that if you want to uh, book a restaurant or try to go to a nice place for mother's day it's almost impossible unless you book several weeks or even months in advance but on father's day you can go to a restaurant on father's day sunday morning and walk walk in and have a, have a great seat so the disparity is there. Uh, I often joke that the Father's Day is the, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim compared to Mother's Day, uh, which is the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, we're, we're always the second fiddle day, but I, do, I definitely, as a father myself, understand uh, uh, why there is kind of a difference. Um, when we talk about God, our Father, uh, it's actually uh, God, our Mother as well. Because if you look through scripture, uh, it, there's many, many instances of God playing both the traditional father role and the mother role for his people, many, many verses. And so that is something that we should uh, be grateful for. We should feel thankful for because we can rely on him specifically to, to take care of all of our needs. And so uh, we don't have to go to mom when, when things happen and go to dad for different things. We can go to God, our God. And so uh, let us uh, thank our God that we can go to him specifically for all things. Um, with that in mind, happy Father's Day um, and hope all of you have a great weekend and may you be blessed from this service and see you next week. Thank you. I can see it in your eyes that you are restless The time has come for you to leave It's so hard to let you go But in this life I know you have to be Who you were made to be As you step out on the road I'll say a prayer so that in my heart, you always will be there This is not goodbye I know we'll meet again So let your life begin Cause this is not goodbye It's just I love you to take with you until you're home again The stirring in your soul has left you wondering Should you stay or turn around? Well, just remember that your dreams, they are a promise That you were made to change the world 
So don't let fear stop you now Cause this is not goodbye I know we'll meet again So let your life begin Cause this is not goodbye It's just I love you to take with you until you're home again Oh, I know the brightest star above Was created by the one who loved More than we'll ever know To guide you when you're lost What started as a still small voice Is raging now and your only choice Is to follow who you are is not goodbye I know we'll meet again Oh, this is not Hey church family, Brad Cacho here. I am here at the hospital and actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this mask off because I'm in the call room and I assure you there's no one else in here. I'm completely secluded, so we should be good. Um, also, this stuff behind me, there are no patient identifiers, so legally we're good too. Um, I was asked to do a testimonial and the reason I'm doing it here at the hospital is because I forgot to do it earlier this week and I'm on call tonight. So hopefully Eugene, you have enough time to edit this. Um, it's no secret that there's a lot of craziness going on in our world, a lot of uncertainty. We're dealing with a pandemic that changes, it seems like every day and it's hard to keep up. Like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty, and I think that's the scariest part, because people just want to have some semblance of life coming back. And going along with that, um, we're living in a recent time where there are a lot of people hurting and a lot of issues going on in our country. And it's hard to know what to do during these times and how you can make a difference. Um, Unfortunately, I see a lot of arguing back and forth and a lot of division. And I've come to realize that most of the people, they really just want what's best for the country and for the world. And they just have kind of different approaches of what that means. Um, but why do they argue? And I've realized that I'd rather focus on, this might sound cliche, but I'd rather focus on love than division, because I think love is what can heal division. And unfortunately, a lot of division happens when we try to change someone else. But honestly, before you can change someone else, I think you have to change yourself first. You have to deal with your pride. You have to deal with all your selfishness and your attitudes, everything like that. Because that's the only way you'll, you'll be able to change people is if you're going to change yourself first. And I think the way that we get there is by living a life of love and of grace, as what Jesus had done. During this time, it's been really crazy, and a lot of us have felt pretty isolated. Um, recently, I had to get a, a surgery done for the very first time in my life. And even though I'm a doctor, <laughs> I've actually never had anything like even an IV placed before. Um, I'd never been intubated, never had general anesthesia, and I was gonna have to have all of that done. So and when I was at the surgical center, they wouldn't even let, allow Erica to come in because of the COVID restrictions. So. I was there by myself, you know, kind of nervous. And lo and behold, while I'm there sitting in my bed waiting to go to surgery, I see Ed Coe. 
and he's in his scrubs. He comes over to me, you know, he, he has some clout over at the surgical hospital. Um, but I really appreciated the fact that he took time out of his busy day just to come spend some time with me before my surgery um, to have a little bit of, of fellowship with one another. We call, he, he called up Pastor Richard and Pastor Juni um, on FaceTime and we were able to talk a little bit and um, Pastor Juni prayed for me and I really appreciated that. And we called uh, Eugene Kim as well just to give some support. And it made me realize that if there is anything that I can say about our church, it's that we're full of love. And even though we're apart, I am reassured that there are people who care about me at the church. Um, and I just want you to know that if you are feeling sad or depressed, lonely, or even disillusioned with the church or with what's going on in our world, just know that there are people who care about you and who love you and want to be there for you. And if you get from that experience a little bit of um, inspiration to try and be that way to others, then I think that's how we can change the world. Hope you guys have a happy Sabbath. Hi, Pastor Jenny here. Hope you have all been very well. The following story I'm sharing with you this morning is a very true story that happened just last summer near the end of August. For a few days, I was at a friend's beautiful home in the countryside of Northern California. It was a dream come true with lots of fresh air, big land, grass, trees, and animals. One morning, I walked around the house to explore and discovered the backyard with a hammock hanging down a nice big tree. So I climbed in and began spending a good long time with God, praying and talking to Him, thinking about what He has done for me, reading stories and promises in my Bible, and being really happy and peaceful. Oh, what a lovely day it was. While I was doing this, my very good friend, Tony, came up from Sacramento to pick me up to hang out. He was looking for me and found me in the backyard, spending time with God, and said, Hey, Jenny. And I said, hi, Tony. All of a sudden, Tony cried, it's a rattlesnake. There on the ground right next to me was a coiled up baby rattlesnake. If I got bit by the snake, I would have gotten hurt badly or even died. I was in danger the entire time, but didn't get touched by the snake. Later that night, Tony had a dream about both of us walking together and suddenly a bunch of snakes began to come after us. Tony got scared and started to run away with me, but the snakes were everywhere. When Tony looked back, he saw me walking happily in the midst of the snakes like it was no big deal. And then Tony saw that there was a bigger snake, a cobra. stood up and looked and followed after me, trying to hurt me. Tony shouted and tried to warn me that I was in danger, but I didn't notice and was so peaceful. The scary cobra couldn't hurt me, and I was safe and sound. You see, there is a similar story in the Bible about the Israelites in the wilderness after escaping Egypt. In reality, the people were surrounded by so many dangers and poisonous snakes during their journey, but as long as they trusted in God and looked to Jesus and His Word, they were safe, and the snakes and enemies could not hurt them. And so, boys and girls, remember the Word of God. 
that God will give you power and protection over your enemies, that angels will surround and save those who trust in God, that God will always be with you through it all, because God loves you and He is your Savior. Have a Merry Sabbath!
This week's scripture comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Lord, please help all the families that are going through a difficult time, and please help us to all stay healthy and get through this pandemic as quickly as possible. As we are our part, please help um, us during this quarantine time to look up to you instead. And also help the seniors who are graduating and uh, please help today's speaker and to deliver your message. Please keep your word in our hearts and in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath church. Um, we're going to start with prayer. Gracious Father, um, we ask for your Holy Spirit to join us as we venture into many different parts of your word. Um, please help us to open our hearts. And um, may this not be a moment where we are taught by um, just another human, but you be the one to teach us and you be the one to um, mold and shape our hearts and our minds today. Um, thank you, Jesus. Happy Sabbath. Um, do right now whatever is your will. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus is at someone's house for dinner, and he gives the following advice. He says to his host, hey, just some advice for the future, but when you host a brunch or when you host a dinner party, don't invite your friends or your family or your rich or powerful neighbors, because you know that they're gonna return the invitation. You know that um, they're gonna invite you back and that's gonna be your only reward. Instead, Jesus says, you should invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. They can't repay you, he says, but God will bless you instead. L. Casey, I don't know about you, but I miss eating with you all. I miss eating out with all of our campus ministry students. I miss small group dinners. I miss CM dinners at the IMS, both IMS. And at first glance, I found these two verses in Luke chapter 14 to be kind of confusing. Like, wait, Jesus, I can't eat with my friends. Now that I live in the KB Homes neighborhood, all my neighbors are richer than me. I can't eat with my rich neighbors. Also, I don't know when any Christian, including myself, I, I don't know anyone who does this, right? When's the last time, obviously pre-COVID, when you hosted a huge dinner, but you didn't invite any of your friends or family. Instead, you invited the blind, the lame, the crippled, and the poor people around you. But what I found in my studies this week is that in Jesus's day, society operated on a patronage system. What I mean is people who had money or influence, they created networks by opening doors and giving resources and favor to other people who would then give back with their own business um, or political favors or just different like financial opportunities. And these people who were included in the network would feel somewhat you know, indebted to their patron, to their sponsor. So you can see why in a culture like that, banquets were a huge necessity. They were expensive, but it was an investment and that's how business was done back then. So dinners were how you kept and rewarded current patronage relationships and also made opportunities to make new ones. That's why someone would be inviting their peers and existing family and their rich neighbors. Makes sense, right? And Jesus' advice would have sounded so tone deaf. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? How am I gonna provide for my family then? How do I move up in society if I don't invite the people I'm supposed to invite, the people I can benefit from? But Jesus is pretty clear here that his followers should open up their homes to 
and invest in relationships, not with people from their social class or higher, not relationships that would profit them, but to open their homes up to people who were poor, who were without influence, who would never be able to pay them back even in their lifetime. Jesus isn't saying don't eat with your friends, right? He's not saying don't invite your friends for dinner. We know that Jesus ate at his friends' homes, but what he is saying is we should be spending much more of our resources, whether that's money or time or privilege or influence on the poor and underprivileged than what we currently spend on. And just like a lot of other principles of the kingdom of God that Jesus shared, this practice contradicted with what was commonplace and what was normalized. And when he told his followers to give without expecting repayment, it's because he wanted his disciples to change their motivation in why they were helping the vulnerable members of society, right? He wanted that mentality to shift from, yeah, the, uh, God always asked us to do that, which God had repeatedly in the Old Testament. He wanted that mentality to shift from, yeah, that's what God wants us to do. He wanted it to shift to be motivated to do this because that will alleviate misery that will show mercy and it will, you should be motivated by a sense of righting the things around you that are wrong or messed up. The patronage system was motivated by neither compassion or a sense of righting wrongs. It simply continued to sustain the status quo. And all of these things have been on my mind lately. Maybe you can relate. They've been cropping up for me in my thoughts, in my devotions, in my prayers, in my conversations with students, with friends, the status quo, caring for the poor. What does it mean to alleviate misery? What does it mean to show mercy? Last week, I was reminded by um, a female pastor friend of mine that I really look up to, that in scripture, the words, the English words, justice and righteousness, are essentially the same word in both Hebrew and in Greek. And if you reflect on God's word while interchanging the two English words, justice and righteousness, it's first of all accurate, but it's also a very eye-opening experience. The thing is, when we hear about injustice in the world, whether it's a big, like newsworthy injustice, or it's a small injustice, right, that we see maybe um, in our home, there is something inside of us that reacts, but our reactions don't usually happen in a vacuum. What I mean is there is a political news cycle and that often impacts the way we react. To pull from this week's current events, if we talk about the death of Rayshard Brooks, maybe we start talking about things like, well, he was resisting arrest. He was, he was drunk. And there's also this sense of, Wait, but regardless of that, is it okay that a police officer shot an unarmed person who was running away? And, and we're like, no, that's not okay. And that's our urge to justice, but then we start analyzing it and we start like being influenced by what we read or what we see or what we hear. And we're like, but, and then, Maybe we start excusing it or we find reasons for why those things happen. But in the last few months with Ahmaud Arbery's death and Breonna Taylor's death and George Floyd's death, there seems to be this urge within us as a nation for justice, but it's being politicized away or sometimes even religiousized away. As Christians, we say things like, yeah, oh man, there's like so much going on in this world right now. The problem is sin. Or we say, the answer is Jesus. And okay, obviously I don't disagree with that because yes, technically the problem is sin and the answer is Jesus. But that is also a way for us to religiousize away and water down our desire and our hunger for justice. And what's interesting is, and what we need to be self-aware about is that the word justice for some people has become a liberal word. I actually didn't know how politically charged the term social justice was until very recently. 
I just thought social justice was like justice within the context of like society, right? But that's not how many people view it. And at the same time, we view the word righteousness as this like religious word, right? It's like, it's bible -y. It's a word that we use to talk about God. It's not a word that we use in our everyday. It's a church word. Pastors use it. And there's been this separation between these two words, justice, this very liberal word, and righteousness, this very religious word. And it almost seems like the way that things are right now, that there's no connection between these two words. But... As I said, in the Bible, they are the same word, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is one Hebrew word in the Old Testament and one Greek word used in the New Testament. And this word in Hebrew is sedek, And it's translated into justice 102 times and translated into righteousness 394 times. And the Greek word is dikaios and it is translated into justice 38 times and righteousness 135 times. And I think because we have two separate English words for one original word, it makes sense that our idea of justice and righteousness, since we give them two different meanings in the English language, it makes sense that our idea on what they mean is probably not fully accurate in the context of scripture. Are you with me? Paul Marshall, he gives this definition. Righteousness and justice is right relationships among all things in the created order of things. Okay? So like even bringing to mind verses that we've memorized in the past that have the word righteousness or justice. And if we swap the words, it doesn't change the meaning of the verse, but it can enhance it. It can make it richer for us and it can show us yet another facet of God's love and his mercy. For example, lately, a group of pastor friends and I, we've been memorizing the Beatitudes together in Matthew chapter five. And one of the lines is, I know you guys are familiar with this, but it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, does that mean being right with God? Of course, of course it does, but also, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be filled. That is very much in line with Jesus's proclamation for his kingdom. My female pastor friend who brought my attention to this, she calls a line from Habakkuk uh, 2, 4 as her anchor verse in keeping her a person who hungers and thirsts for justice and righteousness. This line is quoted three times throughout the New Testament. And what it says is, the just shall live by faith. The just person, one who is characterized by justice, one who is justified, shall live by faith. And this verse is actually the bedrock for the Protestant church. This was the verse that spoke to Martin Luther in such a way that it changed the church forever. Right? Martin Luther, he had been struggling with his relationship with God and his eyes were open to the truth that it's not by his works, but it's by faith. Right? Life with God comes by faith. We're saved by faith. I'm not justified because of what I do, but I have faith in the Messiah who justifies me. I first accepted Jesus into my life when I was 16 years old. And... Um, a lot of my friends at that time, okay, so this is like in the 90s, a lot of my friends had lanyards or bracelets with four letters on them, WWJD. Are there people who are young enough to not know what that means? Um, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Okay, what would Jesus do? And my friends, they wore these bracelets, they carried these lanyards as reminders throughout the day that when various situations popped up, that they should take a moment and consider what would Jesus do, right? And then try to respond in that same exact way. And though I found this concept to be really admirable, I also found it really challenging because 
I'm not Jesus, right? I remember thinking at times, okay, WWJD, like what would Jesus do? But then my brain would respond with, okay, well, Jesus would probably forgive them of their sins and tell them to sin no more and then like go and eat at their house or something. But God, I can't do that. But it's something that we as Christians, we still consider often, right? Like how would Jesus respond? What would Jesus do? If Jesus was here now, would Jesus be a political activist? Would Jesus be out there marching? And the truth of the matter is, when you read about Jesus's time on earth, you see that the Roman government was severely oppressing the Jewish people, but Jesus didn't seem to protest that or march against that or organize efforts against the Romans, right? Jesus told the oppressed Jewish people to love their enemies and to pray for them and to forgive them. And I think many of us as Christians, we read that and we believe, okay, well, WWJD, well, I see in scripture what Jesus did. Like, how many years did you have, did you have that bracelet on your wrist? Of course we would think like that. Like, okay, Jesus was not political. I should not be political. But it's also important for us to chew on the why. Why wasn't Jesus active politically, right? Why didn't Jesus protest? Why didn't Jesus march against the centurions? Why didn't he tweet at Herod or Caesar? Why? I want you to think about this. His people were trying to crown him as king. He has been forced to hide on several occasions from a crowd that wants to make him by force king. Right? They want to crown him. They want a political revolution. They want to overthrow Rome and have Jesus be the victor. And by doing this, by doing this, they are trying to identify the kingdom of God with their earthly kingdom. Do you understand the significance of this? Jesus came to tell his people what the kingdom of God was like, but it was still so hard for them to fathom because they were looking through the filter of an earthly kingdom and an earthly king. Going back to the WWJD bracelet, eventually I got one too. I know like if you didn't, I don't know, if you never had one, like it probably doesn't sound cool, but it was kind of cool back then. Like, every, like everyone had it. And, right, it was cool. Um, I still remember mine. It was blue and the WWJD was in white and it had a clear plastic piece that allowed you to adjust the size of it. And I never took it off, right? Um, even when I showered, like I just, it was just always on. Even when it started to smell, I kept it on, right? Like WWJD. Uh, but there were more times than not when it just confused me or it made me feel defeated, right? More than offering me guidance. Cause it would be like, man, that person was so rude to me. That person was so ignorant to me, WWJD. Well, if I was the one who created them, then I would probably start with a different baseline of love for them. So yeah, I don't think I can de- WJWD, do what Jesus would do. Do you, do you feel me? But tweaking my perspective of WWJD ended up being way more beneficial. Instead of asking, what would Jesus do? I instead approached it as, what would Jesus do if Jesus was me? Right? WWJD, I, H, W, M. What would Jesus do if he was me? It doesn't fit on a bracelet as nicely, but I would need to ask myself, if Jesus was a Korean American female pastor in the 21st century, how would he respond? And the reason that this question is so important is my mission on earth is different than Jesus's mission on earth. Have you considered this before? Jesus's mission was one that only he could have fulfilled as the son of God, the word who became flesh to live a sinless life and die on the cross for all of humanity. And that mission is not my mission. 
praise God, right? Of course, there are aspects of Jesus's mission that I am meant to carry too, right? We are called as his followers to further his work of making disciples, to further his work of building the kingdom of God. But he's the one who came to establish and proclaim the kingdom of God. And so Jesus needed to be 100% clear when he was on earth that this kingdom that he kept talking about, that this was not a political earthly kingdom. So when the Jewish people were being oppressed and the tax collectors were unfair and corrupt, Jesus, he pulls a coin from the mouth of a fish to pay taxes. Because although he was radical in his love and in his message, he was not here for a political revolution because his kingdom was not an earthly kingdom. But we also need to remember that Jesus was preaching to the Jewish people in the first century who did not live in a democracy, who did not have the kind of voting rights we have today, who did not have the US constitution. They were being oppressed and mistreated by the Romans and Jesus's call to the Jewish people was, love your enemies. But do you know what John the Baptist's call to the Romans was? In Luke 3, it's just a few verses, but John the Baptist is asked by both tax collectors for Rome and Roman soldiers. So this is when John the Baptist is like baptizing so many people and even Roman soldiers, even Roman tax collectors or tax collectors working for Rome, they came and asked John, what, so what should we do? Like we're hearing your message and it's resonating inside of us. So what do we do? And his response to the people that were in power was stop oppressing people. Don't extort money from them. Don't collect more money than you need to. Don't accuse people falsely. So yes, the message to all, whether it is those who are oppressed or those who are oppressing, the message to all is a message of love, but it manifests according to whether you are oppressed or you are the oppressor. And we are not Romans or Jews in the first century, but we are Americans in the 21st century. And so how does Jesus's message of love manifest in our lives today? How is it meant to manifest? How are we meant to build his kingdom? When I really examine this, am I more of a Jew or am I more of a Roman? And based on that, am I called by God to pursue justice, which is righteousness? And based on that, then how can I use my voice, right? How can I, how can I respond to Jesus' me message of love? What does that look like? Does it look like me calling my local representative, my local council member, maybe the DA of even another city? Do I manifest Jesus's love by writing emails, by signing petitions? And please hear me clearly. I'm not advocating for these things so that like, oh, like let's be like a political church. Like let's establish politics. Like let's, you know, like let, let's go lead the charge for political change. I'm not not saying that, but that's not my focus. My focus is we are a people. Our motivation is not, we're not motivated by politics of this world. We are motivated by being a people who seek justice and righteousness and who use our voices to call for justice and righteousness. And it's important for us to be prayerful and to be led by the Holy Spirit as we think about the ways that our situation is different from the situation that Jesus was in as the Messiah in the first century. Here's another perspective to consider. In Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, Paul writes, submit to one another out of reverence, out of reverence for Christ. Then he goes on. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And then he expands for a while on how a husband should love, right? And here's what we need to note. It is not the husband's job to tell the wife about verse 22. Hey, you need to submit to me. Hey, why aren't you submitting? Like, hey, did you read this verse? Did you see the verse of the day today? That's not the husband's job. 
the husband is responsible for accepting God's call to love his wife and practice what God is speaking into him. And perhaps recently, there have been a lot of Romans who have been telling Jews to submit and to love and to forgive. But the message of God to the Romans is stop oppressing, stop extorting. And this is true with any message or any call that God puts on our heart. We need to take seriously what he is revealing to us and we need to put that into practice before we can go around and tell someone else what they should be doing or how they should be following Jesus. Social justice, that's a politically charged word. What about social righteousness, right? Can we allow God to speak to us about social righteousness? When we look at this world, Maybe we feel despair, right? Maybe we're like, what is going on, right? What, like, what's going on with 2020? Maybe it feels overwhelming. Like, what can we do? How can we make change? We may feel despair, but it's not meant to be a worldly despair. We're going to end with the verse from Habakkuk, um, the just, so, the just shall live by faith, right? The just shall live by faith. The verse that inspired Martin Luther, the righteous shall live by faith. If we wanna live this call, if we feel the resonance of the heart of God for justice and righteousness, the only way to sustain that is by faith. If we try to sustain a fervor for justice or righteousness out of our own strength or out of an idealistic human perspective or out of political ideals, we will not last. We live in a broken, sinful world, but the just person, and that's who you and I ought to be, we need to live by faith. It's different. And though things seem messed up and broken, as followers of Jesus, we know how the story ends. We know that we're in the midst of the great controversy and we know that he's coming back for us. We know who is victorious at the end of the story and we believe in and we trust in his power of moving the hearts of his people, not later at his second coming, but now, today, in this moment. We trust that Jesus delivers people into his kingdom here and now we have a living hope. It doesn't relieve us from the responsibility of caring for or working for justice here on earth, because if that wasn't important to God, he wouldn't have commanded it so many times. But we have a living hope in our hearts that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, that there will be no more pain or death or unrighteousness. And the only way we can do that is by walking with the God of hope every day. And if you are walking with him, and if you are making space for his word and his presence and his influence in your life, maybe for you in the context of the things that are going on right now, maybe scripture is speaking to you in a way it never has before. When it talks about God's kingdom, maybe you're like, yes, I long for that. When you read through some of the Psalms or the Book of Lamentations, maybe you are echoing the cries of God's people, calling for Him to intervene. And when you're spending that time with Him, He will put specific things onto your heart, specific burdens, specific sorrows to address. He will bring to your heart people, people that He's like, I want you to invest in them. He will break your heart for the things that break his heart when he looks at humanity. If you accept that call to be his follower and his friend. The title of this message is Just Jesus. Because maybe before this message, your solution to the brokenness of this world was just Jesus. But I hope that by the power of the Spirit and the teaching not of this sinful, broken human with many issues, but what I genuinely and truly believe God has taught me 
that your new answer will be that our solution to the brokenness of this world, it's not just Jesus, it's the just Jesus, right? The one who is just and righteous. And may you, may we as a community of faith, may we accept his urgent call to be a people who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the, the privilege um, to, of this invitation to join in um, seeking justice and seeking righteousness for your kingdom. We ask for your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the needs around us, whether they are people or whether they are um, actions or they are um, whatever those things may be, God. May you open our eyes. Um, may you claim our hearts for this. And may you give us a boldness um, and a courage to respond. Father, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Um, may we be more like Jesus. May we follow him the way you call us to. This is our prayer in his name. Amen.